Good evening, I'm Keir Simmons, in for Tom Yammer. So we begin with that breaking news. The Supreme Court will allow a key abortion drug to remain widely available in the US. The justice is blocking a decision by a federal judge in Texas that would have taken the pill off the market. The pill has FDA approval for more than two decades and is part of a two-drug regimen that's used in half of all US abortions. This decision means it can still be delivered by mail. It's critical as many women turn to the mail option following the Supreme Court decision last June to overturn Roe v. Wade, which lifted federal protections of abortion and now leaves the decision up to the states. In less than a year since that ruling, abortions have been banned in 13 states, including some with no exceptions for rape or incest, Georgia and Florida, banning the procedure at six weeks before many women know they're pregnant. Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, just signing that bill last week, and three other states have 15, 18 or 20-week bans. Tonight's decision could also have impacts beyond the US, so let's get right to Kimberly Mutchison. She's a dean and law professor at Rochester's Law School focusing on reproductive rights and bioethics. Uh, tell me first, uh, what do you make of this decision? What do you think it means? Um, I mean, it, I think essentially what it means is that this court is not ready to make a radical decision about the power of the FDA, which is what would have happened if they had upheld the orders from down below. Um, so they're giving us time to f actually have a trial to see what's going on on the merits and then decide where to go from there. This is a conservative court. Is it a surprise to you? It's not a surprise to me. I mean, you know, Alito and Thomas, of course, had had their own issues about the uh, um, the stay. Um, but I think ultimately folks on this court want to be making decisions that make sense um, based on the Constitution and based on the way that um, our court system has worked for a very long time. Um, and this is in keeping with that. It would have been quite extraordinary, frankly, um, for them to allow a decision to stand that would have taken this drug off of the market. There were a few ways the Supreme Court could have ruled tonight, but there was a lot of confusion about what would come next, how to implement it if they did roll back access. Uh, when could we hear from the Fifth Circuit? So the Fifth Circuit is going to be hearing the appeal in the next couple of weeks, um, and we'll see what comes out of that. The What came out of the Fifth Circuit, what was actually appealed up to the Supreme Court, was also, frankly, problematic. I mean, they were rolling back the approval. They weren't going to take it off the market completely, um, but they were going to roll back a lot of the changes that had been made in the approval of mifepristone um, since 2000, including the ability to be able to send it through the mail. Um, so it's a very, very big deal um, what the Supreme Court did here today, and it means a lot for women in this country who are seeking abortion care. Dean Murchison, talk about the wider implications this ruling could have on the FDA, especially given that the agency first approved the drug more than 20 years ago. So, you know, one of the things that's really striking, uh, you know, the Supreme Court made its decision in Dobbs and basically said, we want to get out of the business um, of abortion. And here we are less than a year later um, already with this court making abortion decisions. And in this context, what's really sort of frightening um, is what does it mean if this if the courts decide that they can just um, overrule decisions that are made by administrative agencies, right? The FDA is full of people who are scientists and who are doctors and who are doing this work every day. Do we really Really want a judge in Amarillo, Texas to be able to tell the FDA, you don't know what you're doing. Dean Murchison, thank you very much for joining us. And our senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett, uh, joins us now. She's been following the developments of the case. Laura, what struck you about this court decision? Uh, the divided court here. I, I mean, it's a, a court that is a conservative majority, and yet you only see two dissenting opinions from Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, uh, which is an interesting uh, development. I think there had been some question about how the Supreme Court would treat this decision, given that it's the same Supreme Court that struck down over 50 years of pre precedent with Roe versus Wade. And tonight you see them upholding what the Biden administration wanted, giving them the stay that they wanted on that controversial uh, decision out of Texas just two weeks ago, which had rolled back access to this widely used pill by five million American women. Um, and obviously, it is um, a victory for not only the Biden administration, but also the pill manufacturer, which had said it would have had to essentially go out of business, cease production, rip all of the pills off the market if, in fact, the Supreme Court had not stepped in. Laura, walk us through what happens next. 
So now the case will go back to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. I know it's a lot of ping-ponging, a lot of back and forth. It might seem confusing. Why was it at the Supreme Court if it's only going to go back? That's because of how it came up. It was an emergency appeal. The Justice Department said, this is so critical. Supreme Court, you need to hear it right now. But it wasn't a decision about the merits. It was just a decision about whether they should pause that lower court ruling because it had such big implications. The case will now go back to the Fifth Circuit. That Court of Appeals will hear it. They're set to hear it on May 17th, which will be an expedited hearing. If, in fact, that court says, no, Biden administration, the pill should come off the market, then we will be right here again, Kier, in the not-too-distant future. How long, how long away do we know? Well, the, the, they're set to take it up on May 17th, and I would right. imagine they'll rule pretty quickly. All right. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett, we, we thank you. Sure. We turn now to the politics of abortion as the 2024 presidential race heats up. The GOP field struggling to tackle the question of federal abortion restrictions as Democrats look to make abortion rights a critical issue in next year's election. Yamish Alcindor has more. Tonight, turmoil growing in the GOP over abortion. The party's presidential hopefuls divided on whether the federal government should be involved in the issue. Former President Donald Trump delivered the Supreme Court majority that overturned Roe v. Wade. But now new comments by the GOP frontrunner's campaign are drawing criticism. A Trump spokesperson telling The Washington Post he believes states should decide the issue of abortion. Anti-abortion rights group Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America blasting Trump in a statement calling his position, quote, morally indefensible. Trump's chief rival, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, signing a six-week abortion ban into law last week, Greetings but staying quiet about it as he tours the country. We need consent census on this. Abortion positions now splintering the GOP field. I'm pro-life. I don't apologize for it. We should at least decide when is it okay. I would literally sign the most conservative pro-life legislation. Rank and file Republicans are growing concerned that some hardline stances on abortion may cost them votes. Which we know we lost seats in November. Why would you, if you're a potential presidential candidate, take such an extreme position that most Americans do not support? When you look at the percentage of Americans that want abortion to be illegal altogether, full stop, no exceptions, that is a very, very, very small minority. The Republican Party has a problem in abortion. NBC News polls show a majority of Americans support the protections that were afforded in Roe and oppose further restrictions on the procedure. In last year's midterms, Democrats seizing on the issue, avoiding a red wave in the House and actually growing their narrow majority in the Senate. We have an activation of Democrats, liberals, people who are pro-choice, um, who may in the past, you know, they were supportive of abortion, but in the past might have not kind of been driven to the polls exclusively on that issue. And in ballot measures, abortion rights were virtually undefeated. In six different states throughout the 2022 cycle, from deep blue Vermont to ruby red Kansas, voters upheld abortion protections. Republicans now grappling with an issue that has galvanized their voters for decades, but could endanger their general election chances. And Yamish Alcindor joins us now from Washington, D.C. Yamish, I want to go back to that anti-abortion rights group, Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, calling the Trump campaign's abortion comments morally indefensible. How is the Trump camp responding to that tonight? Well, the Trump campaign, through its spokesperson, Stephen Chung, is doubling down on the, uh, on the position of the former president and reiterating that Trump believes that states should be the decision makers on abortion. Chung said, quote, our focus here should be on saving lives and avoiding the radical left's traps, not on dividing the pro-life community. Now, this group, Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, says it will oppose any presidential candidate who refuses to embrace, at minimum, a 15-week national abortion ban. So this is certainly going to be a disagreement that will impact the 2024 campaign. And Yamish, as you mentioned in your piece, abortion is going to be a critical issue in the 2024 presidential race. And it's not just presidential candidates weighing in. What are we hearing from both sides tonight? That's right. Just today, Republican Senator Lindsey Graham renewed calls for passing a bill he reintroduced last September that would ban abortions nationally after 15 weeks, except in cases of rape or incest or to save the life of the mother. He wrote in a statement, quote, I hope the Republican Party can muster the courage to oppose late-term abortion like we have done in the past. Meanwhile, on the Democratic side, Vice President Kamala Harris has been the vocal face of the Biden administration's push against abortion restrictions and against efforts to limit access to this abortion pill. Today, in an interview with Telemundo, Harris said, quote, one does not have to abandon their faith 
or their deeply held beliefs to agree that the government should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. With her body. Kier? Yumi Shalcindor, we thank you. Next to the severe storms striking across the country, deadly weather ripping through the plains and the Midwest this week, that EF3 tornado in Cole, Oklahoma, carving an 11-mile path of destruction through the region. Now 15 million still at risk as the threat of damaging winds, gusts and hail moves east. Priscilla Thompson has the latest. Oh, Oh, A twister tearing through Tyler, Texas. Unrelenting rain in Austin, causing dangerous flash flooding and harrowing water rescues. That water came up to here, and you were just like trying to crawl out the window. People was getting out of their car swimming, so it was, it was pretty bad. As golf ball sized hail pummeled parts of Oklahoma and Illinois. Oh my God. Thousands throughout Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas remain without power. The governor in Oklahoma declaring a state of emergency after an EF3 tornado ripped through several counties, killing three. Many there now grappling with the path of death and destruction left behind. I think I'm still in shock. Rolina Vestal is still shaken after riding out the storm in a bunker in her backyard. This door is probably a good 50, 60 pounds and it ripped the hinges off. When she emerged, there was nothing left. She's now unsure of what comes next. How are you feeling about the future? Uh, scared. We're trying to find temporary housing or even a hotel that we can afford month to month. I, I, I'm not sure. In the midst of that uncertainty, her fiance's boss coming over with his family to help lend a hand. We don't have a whole lot to give. All we have is hands, and so that's what we're doing. We're taking care of our family. How much do those little things mean in this moment? Well, it's keeping a smile on my face, and I feel like I have hope. Hope amid so much despair in a community still reeling from disaster. And Priscilla Thompson joins us now from a storm shelter in Cole, Oklahoma. Priscilla, uh, that's an extraordinary place where you're standing right there. How prepared were residents you spoke to for these tornadoes? Yeah, well, the woman that you heard from heard those sirens going off and immediately ran down here and sheltered. They weren't even able to close the door of the storm shelter before um, pieces of their roof began flying in on top of them. But luckily, they were able to survive. We know that some people survived in their homes, sheltering. But experts say that as soon as you know that a tornado is coming, it's important to have a plan so that you have time to get to safety before the tornado barrels down. Kier? Priscilla, those pictures behind you that just says everything. Priscilla Thompson, thank you. And Bill Kerens joins me now in the studio. Bill, where are the storms heading this weekend? Well, Kier, they're going to head all the way to the East Coast. Saturday is really the riskiest day. Sunday is more just a rainy day up in areas of New England. We still have a few storms to watch the rest of this evening. I don't think we're going to get many reports of tornadoes, maybe some large hail out of this and some wind gust problems in Mississippi and especially in Ohio. But that'll be about it. Tomorrow's a much larger threat area, about 15 million people included. Large population centers like Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, the Raleigh area, Myrtle Beach, all the way down the beautiful Charleston. We're going to watch isolated tornadoes. We're hoping for nothing like what we saw in Oklahoma, but wind damage, power outages, and some large isolated hail is possible as we go throughout tomorrow afternoon and evening. So let me kind of give you the timing on that. So we're going to watch these storms tonight in areas of Mississippi. They should weaken after midnight. Then we'll see these storms firing back up during the day tomorrow. So you get a nice first half of your Saturday, fine for the beach or heading for any of the sporting events. But when you get to the late afternoon and the evening, that's when the storms are going to roll through the mid-Atlantic region. D.C., it looks like around 6 o'clock. Raleigh, probably 4 to 5 o'clock. Notice New York City doesn't really start to rain and pour until about 9 p.m. tomorrow. And then the storm will be up in areas of New England with some heavy rain from Boston and areas of New Hampshire. Not severe weather, but just kind of, you know, downpours and kind of an ugly Sunday end to your weekend. So your Saturday forecast, the rest of the country looks just fine. It's really the mid-Atlantic we'll have the problems with. Still kind of chilly and not the most pleasant in areas of the northern plains. And finally, on Sunday, we see the rain in the New England area. We recover from our storms nicely on Sunday in the mid-Atlantic but we'll see some of that rainfall returning to the southern plains. Here, this is our severe weather season. We do expect this about every other day, and it looks like Saturday is our next day of risk. We have been warned. Bill Kerens, thank you. Now to the conflict in Africa's third largest country. The State Department says an American is now among those killed in Sudan as fighting between military factions rages on. There's growing concern about thousands of other Americans in that country. Courtney Kuby has the latest. Tonight, thousands 
thousands of Americans among those caught in the crossfire in Sudan. A fragile 72 hour ceasefire not ending the wave of violence. The State Department announcing an American was among the at least 400 people killed as two warring generals fight for control of the country. Sudan's international airport shut down, many residents without running water or enough food. The Pentagon now sending troops to the U.S. military base Camp Lemonye in Djibouti to be ready to evacuate Americans. We've deployed some forces uh, to into uh, uh, theater, and we haven't been called on to do uh, anything yet. But the Biden administration is leaning towards an evacuation of the roughly 70 U.S. government personnel there, according to two sources familiar with the planning. While insisting a mission to rescue the rest of the 16,000 Americans in Sudan is still too dangerous. Tonight, American Lakshmi Partha Sarathi among those stranded. There's no plane that can safely land. Um, so at the moment, I'm just kind of taking it day by day, hour by hour. Hour by hour, extraordinary. And Courtney Kuby joins us now from the Pentagon. Uh, Courtney, if this descends further, how far will U.S. citizens need to go to get out? Well, remember, the U.S. military is trained for this very occasion. So to go into a potentially what they would call a contested environment, what we would call a hostile environment or a war zone, and help Americans get out to safety. We've seen it in many cases. Of course, you remember just about uh, nine years ago, 2014, the U.S. brought more than 150 Americans out of Libya amidst massive fighting in Tripoli and around that area. So the military has several different groups that would be possible for this. There is a Marine Corps regiment or a Marine Corps group uh, they're, special, they're essentially a special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force. What that means to civilians like us here is they have their inherent aircraft with them. They are specifically trained to go into contested areas and bring Americans out. There's also the 82nd Airborne. Of course, you'll remember that during the massive evacuation from Kabul in 2021, the 82nd Airborne was sent in to both secure the area and to help with the evacuation efforts. And if, in fact, the environment continues to be as dangerous as, as, it, would, as it seems to be right now, we could see some special operations forces moving in. So at this point, we know that the administration is saying that the 16,000 or so Americans who are there need to keep sheltering in place, need to watch out for their own safety. It's too dangerous to bring them all out. But we are now told, a couple to, to, according to several people familiar with the planning, that they are leaning towards an evacuation effort to bring the, the several dozen Americans who are assigned to the embassy in Khartoum to help evacuate them from that dangerous situation here. And that's such a crucial update, Courtney, for families worrying about loved ones. Courtney Kuby, thank you so much for that. Back here at home, prosecutors in New Mexico today say they've officially closed their case against Alec Baldwin in the deadly Rust shooting, with new revelations leading to the stunning reversal. But a crew member is still charged. Here's Miguel Almaguer. Tonight, seen here for the first time, Alec Baldwin is back on the set of Rust as he was officially cleared of criminal charges today. So I was the, one shot. the gun, yeah. Okay. The stunning legal about face comes 18 months to the day after the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. A source with knowledge of the investigation tells NBC News new prosecutors recently learned the Colt 45 handled by Baldwin had been modified with a new trigger, making it possible to misfire as the actor who's maintained his innocence said before. Then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. Before stepping away from the case... You believe Alec Baldwin pulled the trigger? Yes. The former special prosecutor and DA told us they had evidence to convict, but new case attorneys writing, new facts were revealed that demand further investigation. Consequently, we cannot proceed under the current time constraints. It defies belief that the state is only now learning about how this firearm operates when they are the only people who have had access to it exclusively for over a year and a half. While prosecutors maintain the move does not absolve Mr. Baldwin of criminal culpability, experts don't believe charges may be refiled, as the DA's office warns. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, the film's armorer, who plans to plead not guilty, still faces involuntary manslaughter charges. The case against Gutierrez-Reed is still viable because of her title, her role. With production resuming on the new set of Rust, NBC News has learned director Joel Souza, who was also shot, gave a moving speech to the cast and crew of 200. Tonight, Baldwin is also back on the set, hoping to finish shooting the Western that started his legal drama. 
Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. And we're back now with New York police making an arrest in a 20-year-old cold case of a woman murdered in New York. Her ex-boyfriend now charged with second-degree murder after investigators say he had strong motives for killing her. But tonight, he's still maintaining his innocence. Stephen Romo has that report. Tonight, an arrest in a cold case two decades old. Megan McDonald found dead in 2003 in an Orange County, New York field. Her family speaking out after waiting years for movement in this case. For 20 years, we have looked forward to a time where we can celebrate Megan's life and honor her memory without wondering who ended her life and where that monster is. The accused, a man named Edward Holly, who police say was McDonald's former boyfriend. Megan and Ed Holly had previously dated and they had broken up a few days prior to the homicide. And we believe this crime was intimate partner violence. Police say Holly was already in custody for violating probation connected to an October 2021 narcotics arrest. The 42-year-old was pushed in a wheelchair as he was arrested and vigorously denied the accusations. They're praying me like some freaking monkey here, but it's all good. What do you want to say to Megan's family? That I didn't do it. I love Megan. Megan was a great lover, great friend. The fateful night was a mystery featured on NBC's Dateline. In March of 2003, detectives say McDonald had finished a waitressing shift and withdrew money from a nearby bank before making her way to a friend's house, where they reportedly hung out and watched the TV show Friends. McDonald leaving around midnight and failing to show up for work the next day at a local mall. Megan's family's worst nightmare became a reality when her lifeless, beaten body was discovered, abandoned on a dirt road in the town of Wallkill. The official cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma to her head. Police telling Dateline there was more than 700 pieces of evidence in this decades-long investigation. And while there wasn't a brand new break, indicating DNA evidence may play a role in this arrest. Ed Holly's DNA was linked to a crime scene. And because it's pending criminal matter, I'm not going to go into any further details regarding the, the DNA evidence in this case. Regardless, McDonald's family says the arrest has given them a bit more peace as they look back now on two full decades of time with McDonald stolen from them. We are here for our sweet Megan. Today, the police have given us the gift of the beginning of the end. Everybody loves Megan. <laughs> and Stephen Romo joins us now in the studio. Uh, Stephen, the arrest was certainly made easier since the suspect was already in custody, but there were some issues with the prosecutors? Yeah, the Orange County DA was actually pretty unhappy with this. He says state police did not consult his office beforehand on the arrest, something that typically does happen for a case like this, a big case with a long history. State police have pushed back on that, though, and say they did communicate. Regardless, they're joining the family and celebrating this arrest. Holly is now charged with second degree murder. He was arraigned and remains behind bars without bail. But of course, Kier, as we saw in that piece, he vigorously denies those allegations. More to come on that. Stephen Roman, thank you. And we're back now with Top Stories News Feed. And we begin with a deadly and fiery crash on a major bridge in Connecticut. Cell phone video capturing the massive fire and thick plumes of smoke on, Insta, Insta, on, on Interstate 95. Police say a fuel tanker truck rolled over and burst into flames, spilling 2,200 gallons of fuel onto the roadway. The heat of the fire even melting some guardrails, the state's governor says. The truck driver has died. The cause of the crash is still under investigation. A shocking incident caught on camera at a taco restaurant in Ohio. New video showing the moment a car crashed through a fence and into a group of people eating outside. Several customers and the driver taken to the hospital, but they are expected to be OK. Police say the driver was backing out of a nearby parking lot when she hit a wall and overcorrected. And the NFL is suspending five players for allegedly violating the league's gambling policy. The suspension includes four players from the Detroit Lions and one from the Washington Commanders. Three of the players are suspended indefinitely through at least the end of the 2023 season. A league review says there's no evidence any inside information was used and no games were compromised. Heading overseas now and to Norway, where we interviewed Chinese refugees who have fled the country after being placed in internment camps. They tell us they don't feel safe, as they described how far China's global reach now extends and why they could be returned. 
Inside this building, in the heart of New York, U.S. authorities say China was operating a secret police station, harassing Chinese dissidents. This week, two men arrested. It's now shut down. We cannot and will not tolerate the Chinese government's persecution of pro-democracy activists. The U.S. says it's a global pattern, China's communist government going after those who oppose it. We've traveled to the edge of Europe, Norway, to meet refugees who fled China. Abdueli Ayup says he was tortured and sexually abused by Chinese authorities. What is the torture? The torture mostly electric stick. Your skin will be burned. He's part of a mostly Muslim ethnic minority called Uyghurs from northwest China. The U.S. and others say they're victims of genocide, which China denies. The U.S. State Department says more than a million Uyghurs were sent to what China calls re-education camps. China says they harbored separatist and terrorist thoughts. Abdueli says he and his family did nothing wrong. My sister sentenced 11 years. And my brother sentenced 14 years. Abdueli's niece died in prison. We are living because of them. I am living because of them. A recent UN report documented intimidation, threats and reprisals against Uyghurs overseas and Uyghurs forcibly returned to China. Student Narak was in Turkey when he got a threatening call. So he moved again. It's a kind of like a warning shot for me, that phone call. The anonymous phone call? Yeah. Abdueli and his wife Miracle fear speaking to us may come at a cost to their families back home. I love them so much and I'm sorry if anything bad happened to them because of me. You are waiting for them to die there. Tonight, the Chinese embassy in Washington tells NBC News their accusations are aimed at undermining China's unity. President Xi says every country is different. America just needs to understand that. We shouldn't accept dictatorship. We shouldn't accept sexual abuse. We shouldn't accept torture. And one watchdog group tells us it believes there are at least four other secret Chinese police stations in the U.S., including one in Los Angeles. China says they are just volunteer groups helping Chinese nationals abroad. Here's a conversation I had with Laura Hearth, who works for Safeguard Defenders, an NGO that seeks to protect basic civil and human rights in hostile environments in Asia. Take a listen something that we as an organization follow in particular, which are these so-called persuasion to return operations when people are coerced to go back to, to China. And when we look at the sheer numbers that the authorities in China are putting out there every single year, we just, you know, it gives you an inkling of how massive uh, these, these campaigns are. Persuasion to return. What does that mean? It sounds very, very nice. It basically means, you know, use any means necessary to get people to return to China and face persecution. Laura Hearth of Safeguard Defenders on China's global reach. Turning now to Global Watch and a deadly mass shooting in South Africa. Police say 10 family members were killed in, their, in an ambush at their home in KwaZulu-Natal. A child is among the victims. According to police, at least two suspects have been arrested and one was killed by officers. A fourth suspect escaped. No word yet on the motive. And the royal family sharing a photo of the late Queen Elizabeth on what would have been her 97th birthday. The photo, posted by the Prince and Princess of Wales, shows the Queen surrounded by her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. The image was taken by Princess Kate at Balmoral Castle in Scotland last summer. The Queen died in September at aged 96. Her son, King Charles, will be formally crowned early ne next month, and I will be there. Coming up, big tech now growing chicken in a lab. How it's done, and more importantly, as it taste. We'll be right back. And we're back now with a report on where your next meal may come from. The meat on your plate for dinner tonight is likely from a farm, but more companies are designing ways to grow your dinner in a lab. NBC's Maya Eaglin went to one of those labs to show us how it's done and how it tastes. It's Big Tech's newest take on Big Ag. No farmland, no coops. 
But these labs in Silicon Valley could be the future of meat. There are a lot of benefits of making meat in this way, from 70% less emissions, 70% uh, less water and land. But one of the biggest is you don't need to harm an animal. Josh Tetrick is the CEO of Eat Just. It's one of only two companies in the U.S. that's received clearance from the FDA for human consumption of lab-grown meat. The USDA still needs to approve it for sale. This is not vegan or vegetarian. The other company is Upside Foods, headed by cardiologist Uma Valetti. Talk to me about the science here. How does it work? The science is fascinating, but it's fairly simple. We take cells from eggs or young animals or mature animals, and we identify the cells that are capable of going into fats, proteins, connective tissue. Those cells are then prepped in a lab and pumped into stainless steel vessels. Inside this bioreactor tank, there are billions of chicken cells growing. It'll take about a month before they're ready to eat. Right now in the U.S., you can only eat cultivated chicken on company premises. Definitely has the chew factor yeah. of chicken. Shreds like chicken, too. Yeah. It's soft in texture. I have to say, it's it very, 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 very close. On average, Americans eat 100 pounds of chicken a year. But raising livestock comes at a cost, contributing 14.5% of all human-caused greenhouse gas emissions, according to the U.N., the companies making lab-cultivated meat say they can fix that, if they can bring down their costs. Currently, the only place in the world you can buy cultivated meat is in Singapore, where Eat Just sells its chicken at a financial loss. So if the motivation isn't profit here, why sell in Singapore? Selling in Singapore is a way of demonstrating that this new approach to making meat is not science fiction, but it's here, it's reality. Experts say lab-grown chicken showing up on store shelves in the U.S. is likely still years away. There's a ton of risk in doing this. There's a lot of uncertainty. But the other option is not to do anything, and that, that seems worse. Pushing for change one bite at a time. And Maya joins us now on set. Maya, everybody wants to know, and you are the person who knows, yes. what it tastes like. It tastes like chicken because it is chicken, the cultivated... Well, it's not chicken. It's chicken? It's chicken cells okay. that are grown into more chicken right. cells. Right, which, okay, sense. so... But it's shredded like chicken. Right. It, there was a bit of a chew factor in one of them. I would a honestly, chew factor? A chew factor. bit too chewy? bit too chewy, one of them. Huh? And the other one, to me, was a little soft. But here's okay. the thing. They're already working on the next formula for okay, this. Okay, so cool. But to continue okay, to evolve. That's good. I'm glad they're you know, improving. But yeah. I mean, how did it look? Did it, was it appetizing? It looked like chicken. It was delicious. I had a dumpling. I had chicken salad. And I had two fillets. Chicken and I wings enjoyed. with the bone? No chicken wings. No bone. No blood. Oh. Hopefully no diseases. Like, that's the goal. You know, they're yeah. not animals here. These are just the cells. Okay. That's an interesting question. So yes. animal or not animal? Conscious or not? I mean, it's so not, right? the cell can be taken from an egg. Right. It can be taken from a live animal, and okay. that animal will live the rest of its life. Or it can be taken from like a fillet. Okay. And that cell will continue to grow, but there's no organs, there's no bones, there's no blood. Right. So it's it's a different way of consuming meat, a more ethical way. Some of these companies would say, and we're going to need some alternatives soon when our demand explodes with the population increase. Yeah, and uh, recipe ideas already. Anything you can make with chicken, you can make with this chicken. So what's your favorite chicken dish? Barbecue, I guess. Hot wings. Yeah. There's not going to be hot wings yet, right? I don't think there no. are hot wings yet. Maybe no. that, that's next. Maybe we, that's We coming. need hot wings, man. <laughs> I'm not going to be bought until we have hot wings. Okay. All right. Heard. <laughs> Maya, thank you so much. Thanks, Gary. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Keir Simmons in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.